signs and wonders. Absolute grace. Complete freedom. A place of no condemnation. Zoe Ministries. Where we dare to believe. Let's go to Romans 8. Verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now this verse for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. There are two laws in this verse. First one mentioned is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, a law is a principle. It's an absolute. It's like the law of gravity. There are various other laws that are inalterable. You cannot change them. They're unchanged. They're absolutes. If they should change, then everything will, it will have a catalyst effect throughout creation. God's kingdom is exactly the same. It has laws, principles. So the first is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The second one is the law of sin and death mentioned in this verse. Now verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So those who walk according to the flesh, in other words, those who are flesh, that is those who are in Adam, those who are natural carnal men, natural carnal people, are subject to the law of sin and death. But those who are in Christ Jesus have been freed from the law of sin and death and now partake of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And this is where I want to stop for you this morning. We want to look at this verse. The law of sin and death and the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now in order to deal with this, We've got to go right back to Genesis. But before we go to Genesis, let's stop in Romans 5. The law of sin and death. See, did Christ deal with sin or did he not? Did he remove sin or did he not? Did he do away with it or did he not? He did. Amen. He did. So, Romans 5. Let's just read verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. First thing I want to draw your attention to here is just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin. 
The law of sin and death is none other than this, that Adam sinned and as a result, death. So sin brought death. Amen? And if Adam had never sinned, there would never have been death. So let's go to Genesis. Now just the other day, this is what brought me on to this, something we also deal with more comprehensively in the Bible school. Just the other day, I heard a preacher read this verse of Scripture here in Romans 5. I make my own mistake. He's an anointed man of God. He's an awesome teacher of the Word. But while reading this, he saw fit to make this statement. He read it exactly as I read it to you now. And then he just stopped after verse 1, in the, where it says, Death through sin entered, as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. He stopped there and he said, now that is spiritual death. And then he carries on. And I'm thinking, the text doesn't say that. So why, do, why did he see fit to stop there and say that spiritual death? What is spiritual death then? Is there such a thing as spiritual death? Did Adam die spiritually? Because the proper understanding, of the common understanding, not proper, but the common understanding has always been, and teaching has always been, as I also used to, to teach before the, the Lord showed me, before I learned. This is not what the word says, is that Adam died spiritually. So let's go to Genesis. That as a result, spiritual death was primary and physical death secondary. And therefore they get this idea of spiritual death. And then every time we come to death, yeah, but that's spiritual death. Then the problem with that is it makes death abstract, and as a result, it, it, it develops the concept of spiritual life. <laughs> and now everlasting life becomes spiritual. So it, it's something that's now there while I'm here because the body must die. I mean, we all know that this body is subject to death. And this body must die. That's the common understanding and teaching always been. So let's examine that in the light of the Word of God. The first question we've then got to answer is, if there is such a thing, or if there can be such a thing as spiritual death, then it must follow that Adam was a spirit being. Right? So it must follow then that he, that he was like us, a spiritual being with a soul and a body. In other words, he's spirit, soul, and body. Because I've said to you before, and I'll say it to you again, you are not a spirit who has a soul who lives in the body. You are spirit, soul, body. One man. You're not three. They are not, they're inseparable. What affects the one affects the others. You cannot, you cannot see it differently, spirit, soul, body. And that's exactly what the word says in 1 Thessalonians 5. It says, for he is able to preserve you blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, spirit, soul, and body. So the work Jesus did on the cross was a complete work for spirit, soul, body. Created the spiritual man, delivered the soul and the body from death. Amen? How? By freeing it from sin. Simple. So, who was Adam? Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul, says the King James, a living being, says the new King James. Now, I've also heard some other teachers, and I respect these men, they're great men of God, but they're misinformed, they, it's incorrect. Teaching that Adam was a living, breathing, breathing, speaking spirit like God. And the understanding there is derived from the Hebrew, the Jewish Talmud, not the Hebrew language, the Jewish Talmud and the Midrash, which are the teachings and the commentaries of the Jewish rabbis on the Old Testament. And in that, they have developed the understanding, and the rabbis used to teach that Adam was a living, breathing, speaking spirit like God. Now, are we to now derive our understanding 
from Jewish commentaries? Surely not. These men are not born again. They are not filled with the Holy Spirit. It was not divinely inspired writing. It was a commentary based on Jewish understanding of that scripture. And it's not supported by the Hebrew language either. Adam was a living soul. So he was a living soul and body. He was soul and body. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's not the Holy Spirit. Adam did not receive the Holy Spirit, and he did not have the Holy Spirit in him, and he was not a spiritual man, and he did not have a spirit being. When God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the easiest way I can explain is when I take a balloon, and I go, and I close up the balloon, and I release it. I've just given life to the balloon. Because my breath is in the balloon. Would you call the balloon a spirit being? Would you say that the balloon has any, any, that I impart anything to the balloon other than give life to the balloon? It's still a balloon. It still does what the balloon does. It still looks like a balloon. All that has happened is I've empowered that balloon to live by moving, by floating. I know it's not a great example, but it's the easiest way I can explain it. So that's what God did when he formed man of the dust of the ground, a living soul, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. This is what you must understand. All life comes from God. He's the source of life. And God is spirit being. Yes, and God is good. God is awesome. God is life. God is everything that is light. God is everything that is good. And life is good. And he gave this living soul life when he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He went. And Adam came alive. A natural man, subject to his five senses, in a perfect body, because there was no sin, there was no death. So Adam enjoyed life, and Adam only knew life, and he only experienced life, but he was in a physical body but a perfect body. In other words, not a corruptible body, a body that had capacity to live forever. Now, Adam was clearly a flesh and blood being, for the life is in the blood. He did not have a glorified body. He didn't fall into this body from another body. He had a body like this, but here's the thing. Since there was no sin, Adam's blood was perfect. For life and death is in the blood. It's your blood that carries life through your body. So it's in the blood that all the problems start. Amen? The life is in the blood. So Adam had a physical body, a natural body, and he had a flesh and blood body, but perfect. We don't read anywhere. That Adam had any access to the spirit realm? That Adam ever entered the throne room of God? That Adam ever interacted with the spirit realm other than God? Adam was inextricably linked to the earth, formed of the dust of the ground. Part of this creation. And thus when he sinned, God said to him, dust you are and to dust you shall return. Meaning, Adam, you were taken out of the earth and now that you have sinned, you will be returned to the earth. Amen. And we also see that God came to Adam, to, to talk to Adam. God came and God visited Adam. We don't have any record of Adam visiting God. God would come to Adam. So Adam could not leave the earth. Adam had no access there. This is before he fell. In the garden. He's in the garden. He's on the earth. He's got no access there. God would come and meet with him in the garden and talk to him. And God would reach out to him. He could not go to God. He could call God, of course. <laughs> and God would come. But he could not go there. Amen? But do we not come boldly to the throne of grace? 
Are we not seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father? This was not Adam. And the reason why Adam could sin is because he was a natural man. That's why he could sin. If you study the fall of Adam, let's go to Genesis 3. Now this is, you will excuse me, this indiscretion, this is the last time I'm going to blow my, blow my nose now. And then it's going to be done. I never had this until suddenly now. Doesn't matter. It's no reason to have it. It's been cold and still fontaine. Oh, I've never had this. Now suddenly, this morning, just as I hear, it suddenly starts. Now this is it now. Let's deal with it. Thank you, Lord. That's it now. Now you stop it. It's done. No more. Finished. Genesis 3. Now, first of all, we know. In the garden, there were two trees. <laughs> nicely standing next to one another here. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life. Both in the middle of the garden. Okay? Both available to Adam. God said to Adam, Of any, every tree in the garden you may freely eat. So he included the tree of life. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So, he didn't. Until. Eve started a conversation with the devil. Don't engage the devil in conversation. Don't let him speak to you. Take, take the example of Jesus. When the devil spoke to him, he quoted scripture to him. He didn't discuss with him, reason with him, sit down with him. The devil will run rings around you if you enter into discussion with him. Makes you think about arguing with some people. <laughs> Not because they're the devil but because they hear the voice of the devil, and now I'm trying to persuade them. It, does, it never works. If a man is not, it's not open to the word, don't waste your time. Leave it. Sow the seed, move on. Amen. So here comes the serpent. And he says to her, verse 3, And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the tree of the fruit." We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and desirable, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. Amazing what you can see when somebody makes all the right suggestions to you. Suddenly it's a tree that can make you wise. <laughs> Where did she get that? You see how the power of suggestion works. All the enemy had to do was to suggest to Eve. Now her mind takes over. It's exactly like with you and I. Now the mind takes over. And the mind starts telling the eyes what it sees. And all of a sudden, it's a tree desirable, good to eat, to make one wise. Suddenly, her whole perception of this tree changes through what the enemy suggested. Where did, it, where did that come from? In the day that you eat of it, you will be like God. So suddenly, they're not wise. <laughs> so did Eve now consider herself stupid? <laughs> Surely not. See, she's not thinking straight. This is the way of the natural man. This is exactly how it works with the natural man. 
When she saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took off its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Now go with me to James 1. See the exact process of sin of the natural man described in James 1 is exactly the process that happened with Adam and Eve. The way the natural man falls prey to sin. And the process of that is in James 1. Verse 12. Let's read verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil. I want you to pay attention to that statement. God cannot be tempted by evil. God is a spirit being, is he not? He cannot be tempted by evil. Nor... Does he himself tempt anyone? So this tells me, this word says, God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. So it tells me that this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that God put in the garden and said to Adam, and he, you shall not eat of that tree, for on the day that you eat of it you shall surely die, was not a temptation, it was not a test to Adam. For God does not tempt anyone. So he didn't put it there to tempt Adam. Had he done that, he would have caused Adam to sin. Because he knew what was going to happen with Eve. God knows everything. So if he sets you up a temptation that he knows you can't pass, then God has actually set you up to sin. So he doesn't tempt anyone, says the scripture. And scripture is always correct. So this was not a temptation to Adam. It was not a test. It was exactly what it was. Don't eat of it. <laughs> but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So temptation came when Eve was drawn to the tree. And Eve saw, wow, suddenly Eve's eyes, this tree looked delicious. <laughs> the fruit just dripped, <laughs> honey. I don't know. I'm just thinking of what the mind can come up with. You see, they had a, you have a mind. Powerful what the mind can visualize. And I think what Eve, listen, you must see it this way. This didn't happen in five minutes. This happened it took a while. There's no time to measure any eternity. That's why the Bible doesn't tell us, okay? How much, well, they were in the natural realm anyway, but it doesn't tell us a week passed, 10 days passed. But see the process, exactly like if and when a natural man falls prey to sin. It's a process. It doesn't stop. No one gets out of bed one morning. And as I put my foot down, I'm thinking, today I'm going to kill somebody. It's just a day for it. It doesn't happen that way. Don't intend doing it. It doesn't work that way. Today I'm going to steal money. I don't care what, but today I want to steal. I will steal today. <laughs> I'm just going to steal. I feel like it. It doesn't work that way. It happens over a period of time as I see and I'm thinking, yep, I like. Every time I come to this house, they've left that same Rolex lying there. <laughs> and I've checked it. And I see that thing hasn't even been moved. And I'm thinking, they don't even wear it. <laughs> don't even appreciate it. I'm thinking, what will it look like on my arm? <laughs> so one day, lo and behold, I'm alone again. And he flies the same Rolex. And I'm thinking, I'm just going to put it on. I just want to feel what it feels like. So I just flip it. And I'm looking at it thinking, what? It fits. So that's interesting. What? No, take it off. Put it down. <laughs> now I put it down. I put it back. I didn't take it. And I'm thinking, but it fits. 
And I go away thinking, if I visit there again, it's still lying there. Maybe I'll just borrow it. Because I have this wedding coming up, and it would be nice for a pastor to be. <laughs> I mean, my robe. I'll give it back after. They don't, they don't even know it's gone. They won't even know. I mean, I see this thing lying there all the time. They wouldn't even know. I'm just going to borrow it. Just going to borrow it. That's how it works. And then I borrow it. And the next day, it's got to go back. And I'm thinking, let's see if they miss it first. <laughs> because there's also Sunday service. And just wear it once on Sunday. <laughs> Lo and behold, I keep it. I stole it. That's the process. Each one is tempted. When he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. So now, okay, I'm already a sinner. Well, previously was. I'm not in the example. I'm already a natural man. I'm already a sinner. So I'm already subject to the law of sin and death. So I didn't encounter death now by this sin, but Adam did. See, when he sinned, suddenly death as a result of his sin. And death when it's, and sin when it's full grown brings forth death. Okay? So now I've just started myself on a process of what's next. <laughs> I mean, when you've stolen once and you feel you've gotten away with it, you know, what's next? like that painting. <laughs> wonder if I'll miss it. <laughs> I mean, where do you want to draw the line now? That's what happened with Adam and Eve. The reason why Adam and Eve could sin is because they're natural, they have a soul, and they have five senses. And see the process of the five senses working in Eve's temptation. And also Adam was with her. She gave to her, to her husband who was with her. <laughs> he was there. We don't read that he's absent during this process, but he was silent. He observed. And see the whole process of how Eve heard. Eve started thinking. Eve saw. Eve took. Eve ate. That's it, natural man. They were not spiritual beings. Secondly, we see 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15. Writes the following. It starts in verse 45. The King James renders it better than the New King James. It says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. That's before he sinned. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Now the second verse says, how by it, however, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. In other words, verse 46 tells me that the Adam called, made a living soul in verse 1. is called natural in verse, in verse 46. Verse 45, he says, Adam was made a living soul, and in verse 46 he calls him a natural man. That's before he fell. So he did not become a natural man when he fell. He was a natural man before he sinned. And the most important thing that clinched it for me is 1 John. 1 John 3. Why am I telling you this? Because we've got to deal with the whole understanding that Adam died spiritually in order to understand death properly. And to understand that we've been delivered from death, period, full stop. Not spiritual death. You see, here's where it comes now. 
It says, Adam died spiritually, therefore all men are spiritually dead. So when Christ came, he made us spiritually alive. So he makes death and life abstract. And it separates it from natural life and natural death. While God only ever speaks of death and life. You will find no scripture in the Bible, neither Old Testament nor New Testament, where the words, the concept, the phrase spiritual death appears. Neither will you find a scripture where the word spiritual and death appears in the same verse. You will also not find any passage of Scripture where these two words appear together, where they even remotely mean spiritual death. I don't even think there's one where they appear together. There's no such thing in the Word of God. And that has made it, that has brought us to understanding that we must still all die and then go to that life. And that ultimately there is that life and there is this life and that's a higher life. But we're still in this life. The Bible only ever speaks of death and life. Death is death, life is life. Amen? 1 John 3 says the following. Now, remember I said to you, James writes and says, God cannot be tempted by evil. Okay? In other words, God cannot sin. If God cannot be tempted by evil, then God cannot sin. Would you agree with that? Amen. Now, 1 John 3 says the following. Verse 8 says, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Verse 9. Whoever has been born of God, does not sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. So here's the thing. You and I now, right now, born again spiritual as a spiritual man. When I walk in the Spirit, and I allow the Spirit to control me and and, 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 and I, I'm led by the Spirit. I cannot and will not sin ever. It's impossible. The Spirit cannot lead me into sin. The Spirit cannot cause me to sin. The only reason why I, as a born again child of God, a son of God in this world, a spiritual man, a new creation man can sin, is because I'm still in this body and I still have five senses in the soul. That's the only reason. But when I'm submitted to the Spirit, and I'm under the leading of the Spirit, and I'm hearing the Spirit, and I'm following the Spirit, and I'm walking in the Spirit, sin is impossible because I'm controlled by God. Amen? So, remember, now you've got to understand, Adam, when he was created, there was no sin. Now, if Adam was like God, living, breathing, speaking spirit. And Adam was a spiritual man, and he had a spiritual nature, and he sinned, then God could sin. And God cannot sin. So how could Adam have been like God? But now people refer you back to Genesis 1.26. And they say, but God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and rule over the earth. And they say, but then clearly Adam was in the image and the likeness of God. Not so. First of all, God said, let us make man. He didn't say, let us make a man. <laughs> just interesting. I'm just, there's no, it's just very interesting to me that he says that. Second, and I'm not going to go into detail in that. You can go and study it. I'll just tell you where to find it. You study the Hebrew word for image. First of all, you go to the Hebrew word for formed. That word formed there means God took his hands. It's exactly the example of a potter with clay that takes and he forms something exactly what God did when he formed Adam of the dust of the ground. Now, 
Remember what Isaiah writes when he says, you are the potter and we are the clay, speaking about natural Israel. And you're forming us. Okay? There's the, the analogies there. That's exactly what God did. Like a potter, he took this dust and he created Adam. Now, it's not impossible. Scripture doesn't say it, so I won't make it. But it's very interesting to me that you can't form anything of, of dry dust. Can you? You need some water. So I find it very interesting that Jesus spit on the ground and made mud balls and put them on the... <laughs> so maybe God took this, this dust and he spit in it. Okay, it's some moisture. You know, God's spit is not like our spit, so I, mean, I, don't get, I don't know how he did that, but it's just interesting to me that Jesus did that. Okay? Very interesting. So he took his hands and formed this man. That word formed has that analogy of the potter with clay. The second thing you've got to know, the word, the Hebrew word for image, when you look at it, talks and refers primarily, go study it in the commentary, go look at the Strongs, go look at the Thayer, take your Esau, check it out. It refers to the body. It refers to this body. It refers to the outward image, which is exactly correct when you look at 1 Corinthians 15, when he speaks about, as we've borne the image of the natural man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. And he's talking about the resurrection of the body. So scripture is entirely correct. The New Testament gives the same analogy when talking, talking about image. When he tells you in 2 Corinthians 3, in the last verse, we are being conformed to his image. Transformed. When he, when he talks about Romans 8, where he says that God wants us to be transformed to the image of his son, he's talking about the body. But this is what you've got to understand. God doesn't separate the soul and the body. He sees them together. They're inseparable. A man dies without God, and he dies in sin, and he dies not having received the free gift of salvation his body and soul dies. Soul goes to hell where it awaits the second death. And will be cast into the lake of fire. That's eternity without God. And Jesus makes this statement in Matthew 10 verse 8. Do not fear man who can only kill the body, but fear God who can both destroy body and soul in hell. Okay. So, here it is. They're inextricably linked. It's impossible for the soul to be dead and the body to be alive. It's impossible for the soul to be, to, to be alive and the body to be dead. If the one is dead, the other is dead. If the one is alive, the other is alive. Look at just science. Look, look, at, look at what medical science, science have discovered and have told us. That depression has an effect on the body. Somebody who suffers from depression, which is mental, which is in the soul. It's an anguish of the soul. Look what happens to their body. They have all sorts of physical problems. Somebody has gone through severe trauma. What happens to the body? You see it in the body. There's certain things that go wrong in the body. Somebody stresses. The body doesn't stress. My body doesn't worry about the bank manager. He doesn't know about that. But my soul is going to give me that loan. What happens to my body? It immediately takes on an emotion from the soul. Now, when you are born again, born of the Spirit, they're inextricably linked. It's exactly the same thing. When you start developing the spiritual life in you, and you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, your <laughs> spiritual nature becomes the nature of your mind. It becomes the nature of your body. It imparts that spiritual life, that life of God from your spirit to your body and to your soul. And exactly the reverse takes place. Life starts happening. This is where the guys got the whole thing, and there is such a thing. It's soul power, positive thinking, negative thinking. You spend your whole day thinking negatively and see what happens to you, your body. You start becoming sick. You develop headaches. You start getting all sorts of pains. 
but you start thinking positive, thinking life, thinking this, see what happens to your body. Ask Shamaine. She'll tell you all about that. True? Exactly true. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. They're inextricably linked. You cannot separate them. So when God was saying, let us create man in our image according to our likeness, he, Adam was the start of the process. Now see this thing about the potter forming this clay. This was the body into which God would pour himself. This was the body that he, when he made Adam in that body, it said according, you see this is the thing that is very interesting. And I remember the first time God drew my attention to this, it blew my mind. It happened in John. We've always said, we, the understanding has always been God is spirit, he doesn't have a body. Okay? Now if he says, make man in our image according to our likeness, okay? and Adam was made in his image, and he's referring to the body, then it means the body that Adam had, is the body that God has. But Stephanus, God doesn't have a body. Oh, let's hear what Jesus says in John. I laid this, I thought, I, yeah, and then God showed me sort of all sorts of other scriptures that we kind of know, but we, we don't see. <laughs> it's amazing how you can know something but not see. John 5. Verse 37, Jesus says this. This is Jesus speaking. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. The Father has form? Formed Adam. Now, Jesus says you've never seen his form? So then I went to Genesis, and I found this interesting thing. It's amazing. Verse 8, Genesis 3. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The King James says, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. And just like that, the Holy Spirit spoke up on the inside of me and says, do voices walk? Now, I've always believed, and I've taught myself, and I've always read there the voice of God <laughs> in the garden. No, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. It's like this. I'm behind the wall there. You can't see me, but you hear me coming. So you hear me. You know I'm coming because you hear me speaking singing, whatever I'm doing. I don't know what God was saying. In other words, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. So I, it's very really interesting. So as God's walking through this garden, he's talking. He says, wow, what a beautiful tree. I like what Adam did here. <laughs> well, now that's interesting. You know, Adam changed that. That, that looks good. <laughs> I don't know what he was doing, but he heard his voice. Heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. And then I saw in the Old Testament, Jacob wrestled with the Lord. So the Lord came to him in the form of a man and wrestled with him. He didn't say it was, it says, and he perceived that he had wrestled with the Lord and he was afraid. <laughs> so, wow, I have wrestled with God and prevailed? I mean, look at the relationship that God builds. Moses saw his back. He says, but my face you cannot see, but you'll see my back. Now, what kind of back did he see? A back. <laughs> Some would say he saw the back, the stripes that was in Jesus. Body. I don't know about that. It's possible, I don't know. But he saw his back. Then I found an interesting scripture. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go all there, but you can find it. It's in um, Numbers. You can go look it up. 
where God invited. He's busy sharing the covenant with Israel at Sinai. And he invites Moses and the elders for dinner. <laughs> Listen. Come on, I've got to turn that. That I've got to find for you. I've got to read that to you. You're going to struggle to find that in the Esau. Listen to this. So, God, when he made Adam, he knew this body, I'm going to transform into a glorified body. And this is the body I will live in and I will inhabit. For Stephen said to the Sanhedrin in Acts 7, God does not dwell in houses made with hands. Solomon built him a temple, but he doesn't dwell in houses made with hands. Himself he made a house. He made himself a house, this one. And he knew when he spoke that, the end result would be us in Christ. And ultimately that was a reference to the word that became flesh and us in him. And we conformed to him. And Adam was the start of that process, not the end result. So Adam wasn't the end result that fell, and now God came to restore the end result. Adam was the beginning of the process to make man in the image and the likeness of God. Amen? So numbers. Let me show you quickly. You know what, I haven't got the scripture reference because I wasn't intending to go there today. But it says that God said to Moses and the elders to come up to him to the mountain. So they went up to the mountain and there they saw the Lord God and his throne in front of him was like a sea of glass and they ate with the Lord. So God prepared a table there and he served lunch or dinner to them. And even after that, they wouldn't go back. <laughs> they wouldn't go up to God. They wouldn't. They said, Moses, you go. <coughs> he invited them when he made that covenant. He invited them to come and eat with him. And he served them a table. And they saw the Lord God. You check in Daniel. You say Nebuchadnezzar, he saw a fourth man. <laughs> you see Daniel, you see Ezekiel describing a man. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. So he sits on his throne. <laughs> now they couldn't see what color eyes, what color, they couldn't see those, that was not important. But they saw a form, like a body. And he had white hair, ancient of days. That was all before Jesus. So when the word became flesh, it was Jesus coming into the natural body to make the spiritual body. You don't get another body. This is it. This one will be transformed to be immortal, the spiritual one. And the one that clinched it for me as well was in, was in Genesis when I saw this, which is very interesting. Now, Genesis 3, the last verse, second last verse says, this is now after Adam had sinned, after the Lord God had said to the woman, said to the man, and he pronounced, told them the earth will now be cursed and everything that has resulted as a result of sin. And dust you are, to dust you shall return. Verse 22 says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden, verse 24, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And here's what was interesting to me. If, as they said, Adam died spiritually, how could he then live forever by eating of the tree? Then he could become spiritually alive again. <laughs> the death there was death. Okay, the Bible only ever speaks in Revelation 20 of the second death. At the end, death and Hades will be cast into the lake of fire. That is the second death. And the white throne judgment, and the sea will deliver up its dead, and Hades delivers up its dead, and hell delivers up its dead, and all the dead stands before God. That's not you and I. Because we don't face judgment of sin. 
and then the books are open, and the ones whose names are not written in the books of life are cast into the lake of fire. That's the second death. Okay? But you cannot suffer the second death unless you're subject to the first death, <laughs> which is the physical death. And there is no salvation from second death unless you're freed from the first death. That's why there's a resurrection. And that's why Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15, the entire chapter, because some were saying there's no resurrection. If there's no resurrection, you're dead in your sins. And Christ did not rise, then sin was not conquered. The proof, you see, through sin came death. So the proof that sin was done away with, and that sin was conquered, is that death is no more. So, 2 Timothy 1 says, he made death obsolete. Abolished it. Well, abolished is the better, that's the word. Made, abolished death. Abolished it. Means, did away with it. To be free from physical death then, the first death, is to be free from the second death. To be in the first death and subject to the first death is to be subject to the second death. For this is the thing. When Adam sinned, it was not referring, because here's what they do. They say, but he didn't die that day. So obviously God had another death in mind. Oh, no. He was sentenced that day. So death started in his body that day. God is not like that. If Adam had to die that day, then God would have come past and go, now what? <laughs> now what? If that was what God intended, then he made a man to eat and die. Because now what? Now he's dead. Now what? <laughs> so that was not the intention. The intention was when you eat of it, you will become subject to death. And that day, he died because he lost life. He lost his access to the tree of life. He lost life. He lost everything. His dominion, his right to rule, and now the earth became cursed, and instead of the earth and him being in perfect harmony, the earth fights Adam. It's a fight now. Nature fights man, and man has to dominate nature now. Amen? So all of this, Because that day, sentence was passed. And that day, Adam became subject to death. And the reason why God put him out of the garden is, that's the only way to provide for salvation. If you can be delivered from the first, from death, that's death, then you can be saved. If he had him eat of the tree of life, and he left him access to the tree of life, then he cannot be redeemed. He cannot. What will inspire a man to repentance if he's going to live forever? Carnal, <coughs> sinful, wicked, evil. I mean, all, everything is evil. But he has no, he can't die. Why will he repent of anything? Why will he want a savior? So God allowed physical death. So that he could deliver man from the second death. <laughs> Amen. And that's why the Bible says, Colossians 1, we have been conveyed from darkness to life. To life. From death to life. We have been brought out of death. That's why Ephesians 2 says, while you were dead in your trespasses, because every man born after Adam now is born in sin. How is he born in sin? Because sin is already in him. It's inevitable. It's in his DNA. It's in his blood. It's in his body. It's in his nature. The moment that he can speak, the moment that that baby starts developing and it's possible for it to start doing things, sin happens. Instantly. Instantly. Because his nature is one of sin. 
And therefore, once that happens, he's already... So when he's born, he's already dead. Because here's the thing. You're already in the second death. If you're sentenced, it's just a matter of the sentence hasn't been carried out. The American legal system is a perfect example. Somebody is sentenced to death and they're on death row. Now they start an appeal process. First they appeal to the higher court, gets rejected. Go to the Supreme Court, get rejected. Now their last appeal is to the governor of the state for a pardon. He rejects them, then they're executed. But the whole time, they're dead. They're called dead men walking. They're for all intents and purposes already dead. It's just awaiting execution. So while they're still alive in death row on the cell, they, is, they are as good as dead. Because the sentence is irreversible unless there is a pardon or the, hof, the court over, overturns it. Now, this is it then. While this man, when he's born, he's dead in his trespasses and sins because he's already subject to the law of sin and death and he's already going to die and face the second death. While this process, he's here in this body. He's alive in the natural, but he's all intents and purposes dead because he's a man sentenced to death and he's awaiting the day he dies for the sentence to be carried out. He can be pardoned. God can pardon him, which is exactly what he did through Jesus Christ. Now, if I will take the free gift of salvation... I will be pardoned. What happens to me if I'm on death row and I'm pardoned? My sentence is overturned and I'm released. I'm free. That's what happens when I come to Christ. But he doesn't pardon. He gives me new life. He makes a new creation. I said to you last time, you're not a forgiven sinner. You're a new creation. Big difference. Big difference. You receive a new nature. You're born of the Spirit now, born of the Father, born of incorruptible seed. And then, death has no more power over you. And if you should die as a child of God, as a Christian, you should die. There is resurrection, which is deliverance from the second death. And if there was no resurrection, you'll still be in the second death. But do you have to die in order to be resurrected, to have that life, or can you believe for it now? That's the question. So up to now, the teaching has always been, because of this understanding of spiritual death and natural death and spiritual this and that, that we must all die. Well, if you've been delivered from sin, and your spirit, soul, body is inextricably linked, and the life that you now have is in your spirit, I find no reason why you should die. That's why Jesus said to, to and this is where we'll, we'll, we'll stop for this morning. That's why Jesus said to Martha in John 11. He waits four days to go. Knowing Lazarus has died. And then he says, Lazarus is asleep. I go to wake him up. The disciple says, Jesus, Jesus, if he's sleeping, he'll be okay. Why bother? <laughs> Jesus says, ah. Oh, let me talk plainly to you because you understand nothing. He's dead. I go to, for him to be raised. Oh, okay. Thomas, let's go with him so we can die with him. Because you see, he left that region because they were trying to kill him. But he left there for his disciples, on his disciples' behalf, so they don't be killed because he can't be killed. <laughs> he said in John 10, I have received this commandment from the Father, to lay down my life and to take it up. I have both the power to lay it down, lay it down and take it up. No man takes my life from me which is the power you have now, by the way. You don't, you don't lose it unless you give it up. Amen? So he says to Martha, he says to him, he says, Martha, your brother will rise again. Because she says to him, Lord, if you were here, my brother would live. Too late. That's what we've done. We've made death this iconic <coughs> idol. This, we've given it this iconic status. When somebody's sick, we rush to get there because we've got to get there before they die. Because once they're dead, then mm, you know, that's, it, that's it now. That's it. But they can still be healed while alive. Are they still alive? I'm coming, I'm coming. And we rush off. To, don't read that Jesus rushed anywhere. Never. 
whether they were still alive, whether they really died, it's irrespective whether he healed or raised. So he gets there. He didn't get there for Lazarus. Now she's upset. But even now I know that whatever you ask God, he will do for you. He says to her this statement, Mary, your brother will rise again. She immediately goes to doctrine. Perfect, perfect theology. Yes, Lord, I know he will rise again in the last day. When I share these things with other guys who don't see it, some guys who are into theology, the first thing they say to me is, amen, we agree, in the resurrection. I say, but does it have to be in the resurrection? Yes, of course it does. This body must die. Why? Yeah, but brother, it's still the natural body. <laughs> yeah, but why can't it be transformed? Yes, but in the resurrection. So they'll believe everything I tell you now, but in the resurrection. Exactly what Martha did. Yes, Lord, in the resurrection. He says, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die. It's interesting to me that Jesus didn't say will die. Even there, he didn't say will. He didn't make it an absolute rule that they will. He said, may die, they will live. And he who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She doesn't answer. She does exactly what the church does others do when I talk to them about this. They default to their perfect theology. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Son of God that has to come into the world. Never answered the question. I am the resurrection and the life. He who lives in he who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. Resurrection. But he who lives and believes in me shall never die. That is the transformation in this life. To be transformed from glory to glory, from the natural glory to the spiritual glory, from the natural body to the spiritual body. To move in this life from one state of the body to another state of the body and receive the glorified body here without seeing death. And that has to do with seed. That's where I will go tonight. You've been born again of incorruptible seed. And I've seen some amazing things about the seed. And the principle of seed. And what was mean, meant by seed. And that seed is the ever-living word of God which endures forever. The eternal word of God and eternal seed which you have been born again by. And that's where we will pick up tonight. Amen. So there is no such thing as spiritual death. Adam didn't die spiritually because he was not a spirit being. He was a natural man. Death is death. And to suffer one is to suffer the other. To die physically is to be in the second death if you don't have Christ already. But to be born without Christ is to be already dead because while you're alive in this body, you're just awaiting the time that you're going to physically die and sentence be carried out. But you can be pardoned in that time and then be delivered from the second death. But if you're not delivered from the first death, you're still subject to the second death. And to be delivered from that second death, which is eternal separation from God, is to be delivered from the first death. You cannot separate. You're inextricably linked. Death is death, life is life. To have everlasting life is to have it now here in the body. No such thing as spiritual life and natural life. Everlasting life, and, no, that was when you were in Adam. Now you're in Christ. Amen. So we need to get this so we can live and not die. We can conquer death and Christ can return with the saints. Hi, my name is Pastor Johan Mankies from Zoe Ministries, South Africa, here in Rudderport. I just want to say thank you for, for watching this message. And I really pray that God has touched you, He has encouraged you, He has uplifted you in Jesus' name. Also, I want to say to you, if you've never made Jesus your Lord 
it is very simple. All that you say is, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, and I believe and confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Very simple. Then you are saved. If you want more information about myself and about our ministry, please do not hesitate to visit our website and see what we're all about and what we have to offer. So I just want to say bless you again and thank you again for watching this awesome message. Amen. Bless you. Thank you.